evening. Thank you for coming today. What a great food now. Uh, it's nice to see all of you here today as we continue our journey through this uh, season of Lent. And we gather with uh, Father Hartley, not only to listen uh, from his wisdom, but also to help us prepare uh, to celebrate Easter uh, in a few weeks. So before uh, Father Hartley starts, let us start with prayer. Today we come together in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Heavenly Father, as we gather today, we give you thanks for the many blessings you have given us. Have a special way we thank you for this time of Lent, for these holidays that you have given us as an opportunity to look into our lives deepening our relationship with you. We also thank you for Father Hartley, we thank you for his wisdom, but especially we thank you for his friendship and his uh, willingness to share with us not only uh, the intellect that you have given him, but also your love and that and the, the love he has for each one of us. As we gather today, we also pray, we we'll continue praying for the peace in our world, especially We pray for them, we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. Hail Mary. And thank you, Father Miguel, for the opportunity of sharing some reflections upon Mary, the mother of God, the mother of Jesus. It really is a, a treat to be able to gather together to you, and I, I thank you for taking time out, you know, from a busy time, especially even when it's cold, to gather here with us. And I'd also like to welcome anyone who's watching uh, this video online as well. We thank you for for joining us. A couple of what I might call housekeeping matters. Um, I'm going to talk for about an hour, if that's all right with you, and then I'll open it up to any questions you may have for about 10 minutes or so. And then I'd also like to give the opportunity of those who are watching online, if they would like to, if they've got any questions they'd like to ask as well, and they can send them to us. And I'm also, I've also given out two handouts, if you look at them. The, the one is uh, just a, a brief summary in a sort of um, slide format of uh, the main things of my talk tonight. And then secondly, there is a, a handout with the first two chapters of the Gospel of Luke, because those are the 
probably the, the center point of our reflection on Mary, and it's taken from the English Standard Version, so you have that. Those of you who are at home, if you've got your Bibles, you can uh, just get, take them out at um, the, the uh, St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 1 and 2. Uh, but the handout itself is, is taken from, as I say, the English Standard Version. Now, that's a translation which I've fallen in love with in the last six, seven years. And uh, the reason for it is, well, first of all, it was a student of mine at Gonzaga, not a Catholic, who was using it, and he showed it to me, and I was quite amazed. And if I can say a little bit about it, it's called, as I say, the English Standard Version. ESV is the abbreviation for it. And um, th this translation it belongs to a long tradition in uh, the English-speaking world of translations of the Bible. Huh? Uh, going back, obviously, in the, in the, um, in the uh, Anglican tradition or the Episcopal tradition where um, the King James Version uh, was uh, brought out in the 1600s. In fact, it was 1611 when the King James Version came out, and it was a, a translation that was built upon a, fir, a previous translation of Win, William Tyndale. Well, just to give you the history of this, the, at the same time, the Catholic Church came out with its translation, of which is called the Douay, version, Douay Reims version of the Bible, because that was translated in France in Douay Reims. But the King James uh, a, 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 a translation of the Bible is uh, what has made is part what has actually built the English language itself, eh? because so many of our quotations from the Bible come from the King James translation. Eh? We mightn't realize it, but it is that it is the case. But then, as the years went by, and obviously from 1611 until um, you know a couple of centuries later, it was necessary to to try to update the translation itself given the knowledge that one had gained with regard to um, discoveries, etc., uh, with regard to manuscripts and so forth, that then another translation was made in England called the English Revised Version. The Revised Version means just revising the King James Version. And at the same time, in the United States, there was a, an American Standard Version, which came out in 1901. I don't want to bore you with all these details, but what is fascinating is that the standard version of the Bible, which is the American standard version, which is a translation, uh, an update, shall we say, of the King James Version, then was trans uh, retranslated again, um, by, by, and, and it was, became what is called the Revised Standard Version, RSV, in 1951. Huh? And that was a translation that Roman Catholics used as well. So for the first time in 1951, Catholics and non-Catholics were using the same translation of the Bible, which is really, really beautiful. And then it was just recently in 1971 that, um, the, the, no, sorry, not 1971, but it was in, what, what date are we looking at here? Somewhere around, and, oh, I can't get the right date here, I thought I had it here. But um, it, when this, the re revised standard version was again updated and it was translated in 2001, 2001, so not so long ago, and the English standard version has come about. Eh? So if I can just repeat, the King James version, the American standard version, and now we've got the English standard version. Eh? And what's beautiful about this is that it has preserved the beauty of the English language, which the King James Version really had. But at the same time, it's updated it to more modern usage as we, as we used to today, as well as looking at the, the manuscripts and so forth that have come about. Eh? And this is what they say at the beginning, just to show you. It says, they say, to this end, each word and phrase in this e English Standard Version has been carefully weighed against the original Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek to ensure the fullest accuracy and clarity and to avoid, and to avoid under-translating or over-translating any nuance of the original text. 
The words and phrases themselves grow out of the Tyndale King James legacy. And then it just goes on in that particular vein. Today in, the, uh, in England, the English Catholic uh, bishops have approved this one for use in their liturgy. So that's what the, that, this is the translation they use in their liturgy. And also in India, they're using this translation as well. Huh? So I, I go into all this de these details because what I think is so beautiful is we have a tradition of an English Bible that has been passed on over centuries. Huh? And so it's preserved what is the foundation of our English language in many ways. Now, in regards to the, from the Catholic perspective, the Douay Reims version is, is a really good translation, but it has, never gone, it has not gone through that update or that development that this has gone through. Huh? We have or we use here in our liturgy, as you know, the New American Bible, revised edition it's called, and as you know from what I say on many occasions, it's a horrible translation. Even though I'm a Catholic, I'm embarrassed to use it <laughs> because the English isn't good. I, I sometimes listen there and said, well, if an English teacher was listening to this, what would they say? <laughs> so it's bad enough. <laughs> anyway, I'm not going to go on with all of that, but that's the context. So part of me, if I can, for those of you who know me, I, I want to emphasize the simple fact that, you know, I studied for the priesthood, began my studies in 1963, and you know that Vatican II started in 1962. So I entered the, started my studies a year after the beginning of Vatican II. Vatican II ended in 65, and I went to Rome in 67 and was there to, through 71. So the, the Vatican II, which is probably the most historic event happening in the Catholic Church for 500 years, uh, since the 1500s and Martin Luther. Uh, and so what the Church tried to do in Vatican II, this was its aim, and Pope John XXIII said two things. He said, I want this council, first and foremost, to focus its attention on the scriptures, to help Catholics come to recognize the importance and significance of the scriptures as the foundation of their faith. And secondly, he said, I want this council also to pay attention always in what they say and do in regards to how it, re re it relates to our brothers and sisters of other Christian f uh, groups. So it was the ecumenical dimension as well as the foundation of the, of the scriptures, which is so, so significant and important. Now, it's not that the Catholic Church uh, forgot about the scriptures. No, it was always there. Just look at our liturgy, our, our worship on a Sunday. There always, there's always been at least two readings taken from the scriptures. But sadly, for 500 years, um, you know, after the disputes with Martin Luther, uh, etc., et what happened was that the Catholic Church said, well, the, the Protestants are the ones who read the scriptures. We don't. Uh, we, we sort of, I don't know what we do, but uh, somehow or other the scriptures were unimportant. I'm sure many of you who are probably my age, when you were growing up, you were never encouraged to read the scriptures, were you? Huh? That's the something that they said the Protestants do. Huh? But the Vatican II brought us to a realization that we have such a wonderful wealth that we share with other Christians uh, with regard to the scriptures. That's the foundation of who we are. It's the foundation of our worship, our liturgy. Nothing is more important than the scriptures. Uh, and I think it's so beautiful that we can also use the same translation that other Christians are using. And uh, this is the one that I'm using here tonight. I'm just saying that. Obviously, I can't use it in our common worship because our bishops would be very upset with me. But if I went to England, I'd be able to read it as well. <laughs> so that's just a background and part of something that's very dear to me. So coming back to the point of my studies, with, I was studying at the time of Vatican II. And for me, this is the essence of what I understand my priesthood is. The scripture is the foundation of my life, as is respect for other Christians and their insights into the, the liturgy and also into the word of God. So with that in mind, I'd, li I'd like to also talk a, again a little bit of a context before I start talking about Mary specifically, and, and that is 
what actually are the scriptures? In other words, why are they seen to be so important for us? Well, if you put it in the wider context, the God we believe in is the God who created us. He created us not to ignore us, but he wanted us in a relationship with him. And that's what our Lent is all about, trying to come into this deeper relationship with God. But from the beginning of uh, the creation, what has mankind done? They've constantly turned their backs on God, huh? saying, look, we're going to do things our way. And what happens with doing things our way? The world that we're living in today is a good example of it. Huh? Wars, etc. Huh? We turn our backs on, on one another, brothers and sisters, uh, people have been created by the same living God trying to kill each other. Huh? That's not what God wanted. But anyway, so God, despite what human beings were doing, God constantly tried to bring us back to himself. Huh? He first of all tried it through the people of Israel. A nation he created for himself, his own people, God's chosen people. And he tried to bring them into that, back to this relationship with him by giving them his word, huh? by instructing them through the prophets, through Moses. These are the teachings that God wants you to follow. That is God's word being given to them. But what does the history of Israel show over and over again? Again, they, they're in a relationship with God, they turn their backs, and then God pulls them back. And then eventually, well, what God says is, ultimately he prepares them for the idea that he's going to send a savior, a messiah to bring the humanity back to God. Yeah? And so the writings of the, that we have in these scriptures in the Old Testament is always looking forward to the coming of this Savior, this Messiah. And then with the birth of Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection, we have God then once again, through, not just through his uh, intermediaries or other people, but through his own beloved son, through his death and resurrection, brings us back to himself. And so these writings are centered on, first and foremost, the person of Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is pointing the way towards Christ, and the New Testament is telling us about Christ and what his message is all about. It is always centered on the person of Jesus Christ. That is the essence of what we believe. So these writings here are a record putting in writing of God's word that God has addressed to his people over centuries and then ultimately uh, in, through his son Jesus Christ and the record that has been passed on to us. So that's what the scriptures are, God's word to us. And this word has been put down ultimately in writing by human beings whom God has inspired inspired them so that the message that is contained in them is a message that God ensures that this is what God is wanting for us to hear and to follow and to lead our lives accordingly. So it's not that God dictated on a telephone or on a cell phone to Matthew, for example, please write these words and gives them to him. No, it doesn't happen like that. Matthew, Luke, Isaiah use their own abilities and, and, and talents, but God's inspiration ensures that the message they present is true. And that's why for us, scripture is the foundation of our faith. Everything we believe in is based on what these scriptures contain. Now there has been and there is a lot of discussion in the difference, shall we say, between Catholics and other Christians with regard to the and overemphasis that has been given to, to say, sola scriptura is what Martin Luther was saying. Scripture alone is important. And Catholics would say, no, it's scripture and tradition. Scripture and tradition. We add on something else, tradition. Well, it's a misunderstanding from the Catholic point of view in this particular way. And I'd like you just to look at the handout that I gave you there. And um, if you look at the, sec at the second slide in that pa page there, you will see it in small letters at the bottom of, the of that slide, it says, Joseph Rotzinger, 1969, and this is from a book in, written in 1969, and Joseph Ratzinger was a very 
young priest at Vatican II who's responsible for writing a, the document De Verbum, the, the, a, the document relating to the Word of God. And um, this is what he says about the relationship between Scripture and tradition. This is Joseph Ratzinger, as you know, became Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. Huh? So I, I'm pretty, I'm pretty on good on solid ground here when I'm quoting Pope Benedict, am I not? Huh? And this is what he says when we talk about scripture and tradition. Revelation, revelation means God makes himself known to us human beings. Huh? It's important to note that only scripture, sola scriptura, only scripture, is defined in terms of what it is. It is stated that scripture is the word of God consigned to writing. God's word put down in writing. That's what scripture is. And it's only scripture that is this. Then he goes on to say, tradition, however, is described only functionally in terms of what it does. It hands on the word of God but he's not the word of God. Do you see the difference? Huh? Scripture is God's word, but this word is put down in writing in a book. Huh? But as the church develops and grows, it hands on the word of God. So at different centuries, this, the Christians face different crises, and they try to solve these crises. Is, is Jesus God and man, or is he only God, or is he only human? And then the, 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 ch the church comes to a decision uh, of the leaders of the church to say, well, we believe the scriptures say or teach that he, he, Jesus is God and man. And so you go to the Bible. What books make up the Bible? The church has come to an agreement that these books are the books that contain God's word because it's, it's what has been handed on over the centuries. Every century of the church's history, the church has grappled with issues relating to the word of God. And that's what tra tradition is. Eh? So it's not to say that tradition is adding something new to the God's word and what God is giving us. No, it's giving us a deeper explanation of what God's word is about. Eh? You, am I, is, is it clear? So, so we're not, it's not as though we've got two sources for our faith. There's only one source, and that is the word of God, which is here. But tradition helps us to understand how the church over 2,000 years has come to an understanding of all of this. Now, this might sound very um, theological or, you know, not so important. It, was, it is certainly important from the history of the Christian church. But I, I think the reason I'm sta stating, stating this is because in, when we come to talk about our topic with regard to Mary, I want to make it clear that what we find in Scripture, what is the word of God about Mary, is that. And then how tradition, in handing on this understanding of Mary over the course of time, has gave, given certain insight into things. Eh? And so not to get confused between, between the two. So with that in mind... Uh, Hopefully I haven't made things too complicated or sound too theological or whatever. What I'd like to do now is turn to just simply the scripture, the word of God. And I want to, in this talk and next week, talk about what the scriptures actually say about Mary. What is God's word saying about Mary? And then I'm going to show you how the church has reflected on what the teachings of the scriptures have to say about Mary. And then we can show you the development of the, the tradition, if you like. Now, if you want to look at, to find what is said about Mary, there are really two major places where you find it in the scriptures. The first place is in the first two chapters of the Gospel of Luke, in what is called the infancy gospels. And then the second place would be in the Gospel of John. There are two major places in the Gospel of John that one can pay attention to. So I'd like to look at the first two chapters of uh, the Gospel of Luke, and you'll notice how I've put, as I say, this is the English Standard Version that you have, 
And I've tried to, to indicate it in a way that identifies the, how Luke is putting everything together in a masterful way. And I think we could call the first two chapters, it's referred to often as the infancy gospel of Luke. In other words, it's talking about the infancy of Jesus, the birth of Jesus. But it's also like a prologue, the first two chapters of the gospel of Luke. It's like a prologue to the entire gospel. Because after chapter 2, Jesus, the attention of Jesus is on the adult Jesus, 30 years old, preaching, being baptized, tempted, in, and, and so forth, up until his death and uh, resurrection. So these first two chapters are, as I say, an introduction to that. And what Luke does so beautifully is he introduces us to the major themes, the major ideas that he feels is, are significant in God's word about the person of Jesus Christ. So I read, well, before we look at that, come back to the handout that I, I gave you. And um, you'll notice on the slide number four, I refer you to a brief outline of, the, of these two chapters. And I think you'll see something very interesting, how Luke structures it. I think it's fascinating. He has, first of all, two annunciations, two messages that are brought by the angel Gabriel. One to Zechariah, the second one to Mary. And then he has Mary going off to visit her cousin Elizabeth. Then, in the next section, he has two, the two births described. The birth of John the Baptist, and then the birth of Jesus. And then you have Mary and the family going to the temple, where they meet Simeon, huh, visiting the temple. So you see, we have two annunciations and two births. And he does that deliberately, because he's wanting to try and show, for example, that John the Baptist is foreshadowing a forerunner to Jesus, that the, the, the annunciation to, G, to Mary is the most important. The birth of Jesus is the most important. But by putting them in parallel ways, you can see that. Huh? So tonight, I want to look at the two annunciations or the two um, announcements of these two births uh, to Zechariah and to Mary. So, if you don't mind, I'm going to just simply read uh, the first, the, 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 what Luke has to say, and then we can uh, comment on what I think are the, really the significant points to, to keep in mind. So, the way Luke starts off, let me read it. I think it's a brilliant, it gives us some insight into what Luke is trying to do in this record of uh, the life of Jesus. Luke tells us, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile a narrative, a story as it were, of the things that have been accomplished among us. Just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses, ministers of the word, have delivered these to us. It seemed good to me also, having followed everything closely for some time past, to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, that you may have certainty concerning the things you have been taught. Now, what, that's one sentence. Huh? And uh, as in the Greek and Latin worlds, the, they just ran on and on and on with their sentences. Huh? But what he's trying to say there is he's speaking in the way in which a Greek historian would write in those days. Huh? And in fact, quite interestingly, we have a, a, a Jewish historian by the name of Josephus, who wrote probably around the year 70 AD, as it were, Jewish historian, uh, but he wrote in Greek for the Romans to try to explain to them who the Jews are, whom they've just destroyed their city. And um, he writes in almost the same way. Yeah? He says, he, he gives a, a background to why he's writing this, for whom he's speaking to. He, he, he writes it for, not for Theophilus, but for Epaphroditus or something of that nature. Huh? And the, the truth. So Luke is writing as a, just as a Greek historian would write. Huh? And then so it shows us also that Luke wasn't around when Jesus was walking the earth. Luke is probably, you could say, he's a third generation Christian because he's a disciple of Paul, as we understand. So you have, you know, Peter, James, and John, and then Paul comes on the scene, and then Luke comes on the scene. 
So Luke is trying to say to us, well, look, how do I know what's going on? Eh? How can you trust me in what I'm actually writing? He says, well, to start with, there are many accounts of Jesus' life that are already out there. We've got the Gospel of Mark and the Gospel of Matthew. I've consulted those. He says also there are many eyewitnesses, people who walked the earth with Jesus. Eh? They have passed on in preaching and teaching the message of Jesus. I've got hold of what they had to say. And so I've tried to be true to what they've actually passed on to us. Eh? And I'm trying to hand this on to you. And he refers to most excellent Theophilus. The name Theophilus means beloved of God or someone whom God loves. Theos, Philos, beloved of God. And one tends to think that this was a wealthy Christian who had recently become a Christian and he's supporting Luke in his project of writing this. And so he's saying, I'm writing this for you so that you may know, as he says here, the, things that, the truth about the things you have been taught. You've been taught these things, but I'm wanting to assure you that these things that you've learned or heard are truthful. And so, this, but then Theophilus also refers to each one of us. Every single one of us is beloved of God. And so beyond that, Luke is saying to you and to me, you can be sure of the truthfulness of what I have written here. I have investigated these things to the best of my ability based on eyewitnesses and things that these eyewitnesses have written. Isn't that beautiful? Anyway, so we go on. So he starts the whole story with the birth of John the Baptist being foretold. I call it the Annunciation to Zechariah. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abia. He had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the law. But they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. How many times in the Old Testament haven't you heard that story? An elderly couple who desperately wanted a child, but haven't been able to. Now, while he was serving as a priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by Lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So remember, Zechariah is a priest. Eh? And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord, standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Eh? An angel of the Lord. An angel is a messenger of God. Angelos in Greek means a messenger. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. And the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard. And your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. Again, going back to the Old Testament, when you have that encounter with God, the first thing that the angel says, or God says, is do not be afraid. And it's the same thing here. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of their fathers to the children, and the dis disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. So the fun function of this, your son, John, is to prepare the hearts of, of the people of Israel for welcoming or accepting this Messiah I'm going to send. And now look at the response of Zechariah. He said to the angel, how shall I know that? I'm an old man. My wife is advanced in years. In other words, he wants a sign. Give me a sign. Please, I don't believe you. And the angel answers him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. Behold, you will be silent, unable to speak, until the day that these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their time. So that's the sign you're going to get. 
you're going to be dumb until the child is born. And now it's also quite amusing. The people were waiting for Zechariah outside. When is he going to come? And they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple. He kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. After these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived. And for five months, she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. Now notice that again, the, the feeling of a woman not being able to give birth to a child. It's somehow either seen as really devastating. So you're being punished in some form or another. Why can't I have a child? And so she says, well, now she's joyful because she's about to give birth to a, to a child. Now I read this whole account because it helps us to understand the Annunciation to Mary in a deeper sense, I think. Eh? And so now we have the birth of Jesus foretold. Eh? So notice it's the birth of John that is being foretold. Now it's the birth of Jesus that is being foretold, the Annunciation. Eh? In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin's name was Mary. He came to her and said, Greetings, O favoured one. Hail, full of grace, is the other tradition. The Lord is with you. But she was greatly troubled at the saying and tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. And the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Uh, let's just pause there and I'd like to go back and comment on a few things. Notice it says, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel came. M Elizabeth was uh, spent five months keeping herself alone after she conceived uh, John. And so in the sixth month, so it's the month later on, that Mary receives the news. So that's what the sixth month is referring to. And it's the same angel the same messenger, Gabriel, is now sent to a city in Galilee called Na Nazareth. It's not really a city, it was more like a town, but it's built on a hill. You can go there today and it's, it's still very similar to what it was in those days. It's a, it's a really tall hill, not a real mountain, but th that's where it is. And he's sent to a virgin. Notice the reference to a virgin. The word in Greek is parthenos. And the word parthenos, if you know in Greek mythology, for example, there was a goddess by the name of Athena, and she, she was called the virgin goddess, Parthenos. She has a temple called the Parthenon, the ruins of which just you can find in Athens today. So Parthenos is a technical term referring to a virgin in Greek. Now, Matthew's Gospel is the one that also refers to Mary as a virgin. And if you look at chapter 1 of the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 23, Matthew quotes the prophet Isaiah. And he quotes the prophet as saying, a virgin will conceive and give birth to a, a son, and they will name him Emmanuel. So what Matthew does is to take deliberately a passage from the prophet Isaiah and use that to emphasize that this is now fulfilling the promise that was made to the prophet Isaiah 500 years earlier. Now obviously in when Isaiah was written it was written in Hebrew and the word for virgin there is a word called Alma. So I'm just this is becoming very technical but it's really significant. So in Hebrew it says a virgin Alma 
will conserve. A-L-M-A-H, will conceive and bear a son. Now, this word Alma only appears eight times in the entire Old Testament. Eh? And uh, it means a young girl of marriageable age. Eh? A virgin. But the point of it in all of this is that, all right, it can be understood just simply as of any girl of marriageable age. But in those days, um, of marriageable age, someone between 12 and 16, it must be, because people you know, used to marry very, very early. Eh? In the context of that time, it, it is, it must be a virgin. Eh? But then the interesting thing is when this Hebrew Bible was translated by the Jews into Greek in Alexandria in Egypt as part of a project by the pharaoh there who wanted to have all the wisdom of the entire world stored in his famous library of Alexandria. And there were many Jews in Alexandria. And so they translated this, this passage by the word, when they said a virgin will conceive, by the word Parthenos will give birth to a child. And so what I'm trying to show you is what, how tradition is working. You have a term in Hebrew which might be understood in different ways, but the way in which, uh, shall I say, 300 years later when it was translated into Hebrew, it clearly is understood as a Parthenos, as a virgin. Eh? And then when Matthew trans uses his, writes his gospel, he's using the text of Isaiah in, Hebrew, in Greek, which, which, the, which is there already as Parthenos. Eh? So what I'm trying to emphasize is both Matthew and Luke emphasize the fact that this Mary, who is going to give birth, is a virgin. Eh? That is the important thing. And it was seen as a sign at the time of Isaiah, pointing to the child will be called the Son of God, Emmanuel, God with us. That's who he, he really is, truly God with us. Matthew sees that as a fulfillment of that prophecy. Eh? And then we come to the fact that uh, to a virgin betrothed to a man who is named Joseph of the house of David. So notice that specifically it is Joseph who is from the house of David. And doesn't that go back to all of the promises from the Old Testament relating to the birth of Jesus Christ, the birth of Messiah, will be from the house of David. Now the, the fact that Joseph is referred to is because he is the head of the household with regard to Mary. And so the lineage of a child at that time is taken through the father. So Jesus is the son of David through Joseph, not specifically through Mary. Maybe Mary was also of the house of David, but the scriptures isn't saying that. It says that it is Joseph who is of the house of David. But it is, again, according to the Jewish way of understanding things. Now, when again he says betrothed to a, the virgin Mary, betrothal, the Jewish way of marriage, is somewhat different from our world today. And the way in which the Jewish people, or the people of Israel, had, with regard to their marriage customs, was that the betrothal was really the most important aspect in the marriage itself, eh? that the marriage wasn't, there wasn't specifically a ritual like we have in our churches for marriage, but what it was is a legal, drawing up of a legal document in which between the parents of Mary and Joseph, eh? that's where the contract is actually made. Eh? And the betrothal happens, uh, the, that's when this document is drawn up. Eh? And with the document itself, there would be specific statements as regards what the dowry would be. In other words, Mary's parents would have to give a Joseph certain things. The husband promised certain things. It might be property, it might be animals, whatever it might be. It's almost like a, a, a financial contract in which Mary has been almost like sold to... to uh, and that money is given to David. To, but but it, in a sense that Joseph is the one who's getting the, the, the dowry, as it were. But, that, but putting it in the wider sense, 
the dowry that there's a special Hebrew word for that, but that that money then is reserved for Mary in the sense that if Joseph were to die, Mary would get that money back, you see, and that would be, be able to care for her. So it was a, a way of protecting both sides in, in many ways, but that's neither here nor there. But the important thing is the betrothal means Mary still remains in the house with her parents. She doesn't move anywhere. That's, that's the, the contract has been made. But it's usually, it's more like an opportunity then for Joseph to go and build his own house, get things ready for Mary to come. And then the marriage, the, the marriage celebration would happen when Joseph goes and brings Mary from her parents' home to his own house, his own place. And you can see in the Gospels the stories of, uh, you know, the, the bridegroom coming at a time when nobody was expecting or whatever, late at night. What are they waiting for? Well, all of those, the, those virgins there with their lamps and so forth are waiting for the groom to come, to come with his wife and bring her to the home. And that's, that's the way in which the celebration goes about. So that's why you, know, you get the, 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 the concern that when, because she's betrothed to Joseph, then he discovers that she's with child. And that's where the problem ultimately comes. Huh? But coming back to our text, huh? again we see as it was with um, the greeting to Mary. The word greetings don't sound, it doesn't sound very good. You know, but what the, the word hail, I think, is probably the better way of expressing it because that is, that is the, the Greek, or just let me back up. The Hebrew greeting that Gabriel would have given Mary would be, would be to say, shalom, shalom, huh? peace be with you. Huh? That was, that's the Hebrew greeting. In, in uh, Greek, the word is chare, which is actually in the text itself. Chare, which means greetings, is the way in which Greeks greeted one another. And then the, the phrase there, O favoured one, full of grace, that's exactly what the Hebrew means. Mary is blessed by God. God's graces are with her to the fullest possible extent. Of all people, she is the one who's received the greatest blessings, the greatest graces that God can bestow. The Lord is with you. Now, the response, as with Zechariah. She was greatly troubled at the saying. She tried to discern what sort of greeting this might be. What's going on here? And the angel said to her, don't be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You are blessed by God. God's graces are with you. Don't be afraid. She said the same thing similarly to Zechariah. And then she, he goes on to tell her that she will conceive, bear a son, but you're going to call his name Jesus. In Hebrew, Yeshua or Joshua. And there were lots of Joshua's. It was a famous name in those days. And the name itself means God is the one who saves. God saves through you, as it were. So it's the Savior. That's the simplest way of putting it. He will be great, will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give to him the throne of his father David. So there we've got that fulfillment of the, of the promises that go back way to the past. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. God's kingdom is now going to last forever. Remember David? God promised David that his kingdom will last forever. And now Jesus is fulfilling that in the fullest possible way. So we've got a very similar, similar way in which the angel approaches Zechariah and Mary. But now the difference comes. Mary says to the angel, how will this be since I am a virgin? Mary questions its possibility. I'm not, I don't have a husband yet. I don't know. I, don't, I am a virgin. And uh, literally, it doesn't use the word virgin there, literally the, the Greek text says, I do not know a man. And the word know in the Greek, in the Hebrew tradition, refers to sexual relations. I have had no sexual relations with a man, she's saying. How's it possible? It's not possible. 
And the angel answers her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you. The power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. Remember Emmanuel before? God is with us. Now the emphasis is truly on that he will be called the Son of God. And how is this possible? The angel says it's because the Holy Spirit will come down upon you. So you will conceive through the power of God's Spirit. So the, birth, the, the conception of Jesus is not, does not take place in the normal human way. It is a miracle. Because why? It has to be a miracle. Because if Jesus is the Son of God, as well as the Son of Mary, it must be as a result of God, the Holy Spirit's power, coming down upon Mary. Now, I was thinking about this this morning as I was thinking about things. And when you come back to Zechariah, Zechariah also questioned the angel. He shall, says, how shall I know this? I am an old man. My wife is advanced in years. And then the angel gets mad with him and says, you're going to be dumb until your child is born. And Mary also objects and she says, doesn't she? Huh? Um, how is this possible? Because I don't know a, a man, as it were. This is what she's saying. Well, the big difference is what, jo what Zechariah is asking for, he says, I don't believe this. In other words, he says, I want a sign. I want a sign that this is going to happen. And so the angel's basically saying, well, you will get a sign, you'll be dumb. Whereas with Mary, she's not questioning the ability. She just says, I don't understand. It, it seems impossible to me. And the angel says, well, it's not impossible because it is God is the one responsible. And so that's why you get the contrast between Mary and uh, Zechariah. So do you see that in making that contrast, you see Mary is, is shown as, as the one who shows the right response to God's actions in one's life. Eh? You mightn't understand things, but nevertheless you trust that God, this is what God wants, and you carry it through. Eh? Whereas Zechariah questions it. He doesn't believe it's possible. Isn't that like every one of us? That's what it means to be a child of God, to trust God, God's actions in one's life, to be open to it. That's the big difference between Zechariah and Mary. And then he goes on to tell her that your um, relative Elizabeth, in her old age, has also conceived a son. And this is the sixth month, notice again, the sixth month with her who is called Barry. For nothing will be impossible with God. That's again the important thing. Nothing is impossible with God. Don't put limitations on what God can do. I think that's such a valuable and important message for every single one of us. We like to put God in a box, as it were, and sort of tame God and say, well, that's what, you know, this is only, that's all that God can do. You can't limit what God's actions are about. You just have to be open to God's actions in one's life. And how does Mary respond? Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. I am the Lord's servant. Let it be done to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Those words of Mary show the true response that every Christian is called to do. We are all God's servants. And we are there to carry out what God wants. Let it be done to me according to your word. How many times in, in a prayers, and I can say this in my own life perhaps, uh, when I pray to God, uh, I'm almost sometimes telling God what he should be doing. And God is probably saying, listen here, Patrick, <laughs> who's in charge here? Do it according to God's will. That is the important thing. So I think what I'm trying to point to here is the role that Mary is playing in this instance. She becomes an example for every Christian in the way in which we need to respond to God. In fact, I like to talk about Mary as being the first disciple. She is the first disciple because she accepts the message that God has given her to bring Jesus Christ into our world. That is her task. And in doing so, 
you know, in her response, she's open to allow God to work through her. Every one of us is, in some ways, an instrument for God working in our world. Every single one of us is also called to bring Christ into our world, to be able to, to bring Christ to others. We are the, the, only, the major way in which God works in our world it is through us. So Mary becomes the prime example for us of what a disciple is meant to be, to respond to God in total openness. I don't understand how this can possibly happen, but Lord, thy will be done. Jesus shows us the same thing in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane just before his death. He says, Lord, this is not what I want, Father, but thy will be done. And it's the same thing. I don't understand why is it that I am the one who has to suffer. Poor old me. But then he turns to God, well, Lord, this is part of your plan for our world and for me. Thy will be done. I accept that. That is the response that Mary had. So she, what is, what is emerging from the, the simple little expression or, or, or reflection on Mary is to try and show us that she, above all, is the mother of, of Jesus Christ, the one who brings Jesus into our world, God's son into our world, but she is also the one who brings his hum, him, the humanity of Jesus into our world as well. That's why we refer to Mary as uh, Jesus, as, as she is the, uh, Mary is the mother of, of, of Jesus, uh, God and man, the full human person and fully divine person of Jesus, the one person divine and human. But they, you know, don't, the scriptures don't have a ways of trying to explain philosophically what all this, this is all about. But the, the thing is, he's truly God and he's truly man. And the humanity, above all, comes through Mary. And as I was thinking, also, so the humanity, Mary didn't just bring Christ into the world, just as no mother brings just a child into the world and then it's finished. Huh? You've got at least, well, Mary had 30 years to care for him, whereas uh, most of us, most of you, I might talk excluded, um, has you know, probably 18 years or whatever, and then they want to fly away. But so for, for, for those 30 years, huh, Mary is, is being the role model for Jesus of what it means to be human, how to lead one's human life. Huh? She nourishes him, not just physically, but also in a spiritual sense too. Truly, she is the mother of Jesus. And so it's that title of Mary as mother that emerges from the, this particular story. But also, as I say, Mary as an example for each one of us as what it means to be a true disciple, a true follower of Jesus. She shows us what it is about. And um, I know my time is is coming to a, 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 an end. But I, I want to emphasize this role of Mary in this sense. Because, you know, in, tr in our tradition, the Catholic tradition, as it were, Mary sometimes appears as, um, I don't know what the right word is. We have that a hymn called Gentle Woman. Huh? Oh, gentle. It's a lovely hymn. But that's the idea. We look at Mary as this gentle person. She wouldn't say boo to a goose, as they used to say. I don't know if you've got that phrase, but she wouldn't say boo to a goose. That's not Mary. My goodness, she is a strong, strong woman. Huh? I mean, she must be right from a youngster, tw between 12 and 16 years old, huh? to, to, to give birth to a, a, a child in the context of a society, which would be looking down upon her for what, you know, from their perspective, been, uh, you know, at that stage not particular, not fully married to, to Joseph. What is she doing? Huh? Who's this woman? Huh? What does she think she is? You can imagine what the gossipers would have to say about Mary. Huh? To give birth to a child. Huh? I mean, any, shall we put it in modern terms, if a, a young girl gives birth to a child outside of marriage, huh? it's not quite as shocking today as it was when I was growing up. But, that's, but it still shows a very strong person to be able to, to accomplish that. And then as we see in the rest of the stories of Mary, when you know, they run out of, of wine, 
in the Gospel of John. What does she do? She goes to Jesus, they've got no wine. And Jesus almost says, well, what, what's that got to do with me? And then Mary just goes and says, do what he tells you. She's his mother. He knows that Jesus will do what she asks. She's a strong woman. She doesn't sort of go away and fade away. Oh, well, he's not going to do anything. No, he does. And so I could go on and on. But the reason I'm emphasizing that is because when we just simply look at the scriptures, we see Mary as a strong woman. That's whom God used as his mother to come into our world. She had to be in order to be able to bring this child into our world as, as he is. I think that's so important. And, that, and to, to follow on with that, I think the sad thing is in our traditions, um, you know, like in the Catholic Church, for example, you know, Mary is sometimes is presented in this gentle, sweet Mary, which is fine. But, you know, does that really speak to women today? where, you know, women have really discovered their importance and their independence and so forth. Mary is a very independent person. I think she speaks to women in a much stronger way than it would have been years, years ago. I think she really is an example in that particular way. So I say to myself from a Catholic perspective, why is it that many Catholics can't relate to Mary perhaps? Maybe it's just simply because it's the idea, the image that is, that is being portrayed. On the other hand, in the Catholic tradition, you know, Mary is, a, a, in some places, uh, like I was in Italy for, for four years, and this goes back 50 years ago, which is a long period of time, but, it, you know, I've seen it particularly in villages and so forth, when they have processions through the streets with Mary and people singing and so forth. It's almost like they're presenting Mary as a, a, a god, as it were, eh? honoring and worshiping her. Well, that's not the Catholic tradition. And that's what I mean when I said at the very beginning, oh, I didn't say it, but that was the title of my talks, approaching Mary with new eyes. So the way in which I'm trying to say with new eyes, let's look at what the scriptures present about Mary, first and foremost. And then I think sometimes we, we need to readjust our perspective according to what the scriptures are actually saying. Now, sure, there are these different tendencies within the Catholic Church, but I think one has to be very realistic and true that we do not m worship Mary. As you know, many non-Catholics seem to think that, and they, they're not to be blamed because they think that, because I've seen some of the ways in which Mary is dealt with in some of these traditions or ca customs. Well, that's enough from me. Uh, you've been very uh, generous in listening to me for 50 minutes or so or even longer. Before we go, are there any questions that you'd like to ask uh, before we go? As I say, that if you also have questions you'd like me to refer to, if you would send them to joenappy at hotmail.com. That's, that's his, um, his, his, and if you want a, a further text, we will send it out to you as well. But any questions, concerns? Eh? Any heresies that you'd like to hand me over to the, the doctrine of the faith for what I've said? Yes. Yes, what would you, sorry. I, I just wonder, why is it that the Catholic religion is rejected so much? Well, it's, you know, there are so many good translations that even have emerged in the last few years. You know, I mean, basically, what happened with the, in the Catholic Church was that up until Vatican II, Catholics were not allowed to translate the Bible into any language except through Latin, from the Latin. So in other words, because the, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew, the New Testament is written in Greek, but you still had to translate it from the Latin, which is a translation from that. Huh? So you're translating it from a translation, so you're not going back to the originals. So from the, from the Catholic Church point of view, uh, there has been, a, apart from the douay Rheims version, there was no other translation of the Bible up until uh, the 1950s or 60s, as it were. So when it came out in 1960, when the uh, Vatican II made it, uh, made it compulsory for Catholics, Catholic Bibles to be translated from the original languages, not just from any language, 
but then they placed it in the hands of the bishops' conferences. And so the bishops' conferences would give their stamp of approval, imprimatur. This is the translation we will use in our particular area. And uh, so the, then um, the Catholics came out after 1965 with the new American Bible. And then they thought they'd improve upon it and made it worse by, by having a revised edition. So, th so, that's, so there have only been two translations since 1965, the American Bible and the updated one, over the course of seven, 60, 70 years. Whereas in the context of the, the English-speaking world, there have been a proliferation of translations that have appeared over those times. But again, what is I've tried to pre present it with regard to the, the um, English Standard Version, it's tried to remain true to that tradition. Now, the sad thing is with the New American Bible, it would have been beautiful if they had perhaps taken the reams, Dewey reams and tried to remain true to that particular translation and, and, keep, and keep that tradition going, but it hasn't done so really. Now, what happened in the British world, um, they came out with a translation called the Jerusalem Bible. Uh, and they, they desperately wanted to get it out, the Catholics in England, before the, um, the new English Bible came out, which was a, 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 an Anglican uh, translation. Huh? But they wanted this one on the market. So what they did is they took the French Jerusalem Bible, which is beautiful, its notes and everything are fantastic, but they just translated it from French. So they did something even worse. Huh? Instead of translating it from, from Latin, they translated it from French. Huh? Anyway, so if, if this is a, these are long, long stories, history. There is always politics behind everything. So anyway, so I'm a good, faithful Catholic, so I read the, I use the New American Bible at church, and I don't do it, use it anywhere else. <laughs> okay, because you've got that freedom, yes. I think that is, uh, I think they're using, I might be forgiven, but I think they use uh, the revised standard version, RSV, huh? because that was the one prior to this one huh? that, they, that they've, they've adopted. So, yeah. What about the revival? Yeah, I think that's partly the Douay Reims, if I'm, if I'm right. So, that, so it's, it's sort of keeping to that tradition. Huh? Look, at it, it, uh, look, I think the point I th uh, one should say uh, let me be honest, one should use a translation of the Bible that you feel comfortable with, really, and that appeals to you, and, and to stick with it. Eh? I mean, don't, apart from what I've been saying, if you like the New American Bible, use it. If you like the Douay Reims, use it. Eh? If you like the Revised Standard Version, which I used for, for decades, the RSV, um, use it. Eh? The trouble when we get too many translations is that nobody can quote anything because you keep jumping to some other thing, just like I can't say the creed at Mass, unless I've got the text in front of me, because my mind goes back to the translation that I used for 40 years. Huh? So you can see how one's life gets changed. So don't, don't, don't let me put you off. I'm, I'm just giving you my own personal feelings on this. Huh? We all have hang-ups, don't we? Huh? And that's one of my pet hang-ups. Huh? Forgive me, I shouldn't be bringing that to you. But find a Bible that you like and use it. There, are, there is a, a, a very good website online called uh, the Bible, Bible Gateway. Bible Gateway. And uh, that has all that you can find, all the translations in English that, that exist. Uh, and they'll uh, give you, if you want to find out what Isaiah 7, 14, the, the virgin will give birth to a child and so on, what each one of it each translation, how it translates that, you just put in the different thing and you see the translations coming up. Huh? It's fascinating. If you've got plenty of time to waste. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Father, can you uh, just clear up the Hebrew, Hebrew, and Israel? Yes, yes. I was going to do it today, but I think I'll have to leave it till next time. Okay. Yes, yes. Right. Is there something you want to ask about it? Okay, sure. Any other questions? Again, as I say, if you would rather send a question 
to Joe, please do so as well, and I'll answer it next time. Sorry, is there somebody I, I can't see? Sorry, I apologize. Yes. So what you mentioned of Lazarus is the name Mary Anne. Yes, that's right. It comes from, uh, that's, that's from tradition. It's Mary's parents are not mentioned in the Bible. But there is a book that was written uh, about 150 AD, so shortly after the Gospels were written, called, it's given a, a long name, Proto, Proto Evangelium, which means before the Evangelium, before the Gospel. It's really the, it is, you could call it the infancy gospel of James is another name that's, that it is given. And it tells the, the background of who Mary is, who her parents were, Anna and um, Joachim were her parents and how Mary grew up and, and so on. And, and the background and how she, she got to be married to Joseph. But it ne that book, that writing, um, never made its way into the scriptures because part of the way in which the scriptures, the books of our Bible were decided was over the course of 300 years. Eh? Because the, the first thing to realize is that the putting things together in a book form like this was something that Christians invented in the third century. Eh? Up until that time, everything was written on a scroll which was rolled up and so it was always rolled up and then you'd put, but if you were to put all these writings of the, of the Bible together, you'd probably have something like 60 odd scrolls around. Eh? So it becomes a cumbersome thing. Christians were the ones who invented this. So the point was, if you're gonna put it together in this form, how do you know what scrolls to include and what not? Eh? And so you find it, it goes back to Constantine, who at the, when he became emperor, there were so many fights going on amongst Christians, sadly, about what they believed and so forth, that he asked a historian, Greek historian, Christian, Eusebius was his name, to produce 50 copies in book form like this of the Christians, of the Christian scriptures. And so in order to do that, do you see that Eusebius went throughout the Christian world from place to place, and inquired, what books are you using when you come together to worship? And in doing so, he drew up a list of those books that are being universally used. Huh? And then he had another list of saying, well, those which were only used in certain places and so forth. Because you can see, some places would have a real a popular devotion to one book or whatever it is. So that it was on the basis of that, that the, the church, the fathers, the leaders of the church, came to the decision that these books that make up the Bible that we have today are the ones that were universally used. And so it, it's a matter of what has been used everywhere, that they also have to reflect the, the faith of the church. In other words, is this what Christians believe everywhere in, in these writings? And uh, lo lastly, they must have a connection with the apostles. There must be that apostolic connection. Because after all, with the apostles, they are the ones who, in, the word of, comes to them, and they are the ones who are passing it on. So that's how they, they drew the boundaries for what books would be made. made. So books like this uh, Infancy Gospel of James, it talks about Mary, it was only being used in one particular area. It wasn't something that was universally used. And you, when you look at those, you can see that there are some crazy things that are found in them. You've got the famous infancy gospel of, of, of Thomas, for example. Huh? We've got, well, there are two of them, but the one more famously known is the one where, you know, Jesus plays with uh, clay pigeons, makes pigeons out of clay, and he likes them so much he claps his hands and they, they fly away. Huh? and so on, you know, these, these sort of fanciful stories, eh, which had a reason for writing, but that's on another story. So that's why these books were never, never incorporated into it. So that's what you mean when you talk about tradition. But the tradition then, in that sort of sense, has to be questioned, whether this is really reflecting what the scriptures are actually saying. Does that make sense? 
I will refer to the Proto Evangelium um, in the next talk. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Well, the, the, you know, again, we're coming to the tradition in the Catholic Church is that not only was Mary a virgin in giving birth to Jesus, but that she remained a virgin for the rest of her life. And that's when they say, ever virgin, ever virgin Mary. Eh? But I meant before she married Joseph. Oh. Because it was because Joseph then was then she, you know, she was pregnant and she had children. No, I, well, that's, uh, that is... You know, there's no evidence yes. e evidence for that. Eh? I think it's a completely contrary to what is what is being well. Well, that's what the scriptures are saying. Eh? But we'll come back to that talking about the ever Virgin Mary, if you like, which is uh, it is significant and important. At the very beginning, whatever is said about Mary, is not said about her. But it's about Jesus. Because she, Jesus is the, she is the mother. Why? So that Jesus can be born. That's the whole point of it. It's not because of herself. Mary did nothing. What she did, she responded in the way in which humans are called to respond. But it's God's initiative through Mary. I think that's where we must always re realize. If you're putting Mary on a pedestal, you must. You can say she can only be on that pedestal because of what Jesus, what she's, what Jesus has done, was what God has done through her. I think I'm going to call it an evening. Shall I? God bless you. Thank you very much for being with us.